the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, the Honorable Members of the National Assembly, Leader of the House and Leader of the Opposition. First of all, let me avail myself with this, of this opportunity to express my deep appreciation for bestowing me with this rare honor of addressing this distinguished house of National Assembly of the Republic of Seychelles. Standing here, I do consider it a great pleasure and honor to be among friends from an island nation that shares so many common aspirations with my own country. And I greatly appreciate the very warm welcome accorded to me and my delegation. Speaker. Standing here, I also go back in time. When I entered our parliament in 1970, as its youngest MP at that time, and I feel at home to be addressing this August Assembly, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the history of Sri Lanka's link with Africa, our Western maritime neighbor, connected by the vast Indian Ocean, dates back many centuries. We have an ancestral connection, a strong line that binds us to the, this vast continent. The historical 1955 Afro-Asian Conference, or the Bandu Conference, as it is popularly known, marked a very significant turning point in Asian-African relations. The conference in which Sri Lanka played a leading role brought Asia and Africa to work together for the betterment of 1.5 billion people living in the 29 countries that took part in the conference. The Bandung Conference also marks a watershed in Sri Lanka's modern relations with the African continent as we started establishing diplomatic relations with the African nations following the conference, following the conference. In 1976, when Sri Lanka hosted the fifth NAM summit, not aligned summit. We also had the opportunity to, to closely interact with many prominent African leaders of the day. With my assumption of presidency in 2005, Mr. Speaker, the foreign policy of Sri Lanka took a new course and we were able to rediscover our old friendships and affinities with Africa. My address in this distinguished assembly today is a clear manifestation of that timely foreign policy reorientation. Africa's relentless struggle against colonialism and the charismatic great leaders who have given leadership to the struggle for independence have left an indelible mark in the collective mind of the people of Sri Lanka. They have contributed in no small measure to mold the Sri Lankan political landscape 
and its thinking. It has been decades in both Africa and Sri Lanka how freed themselves from cycles of colonialism and oppression. The walk to freedom was long and full of obstacles. When looking back at the past, we can see that we were united in our struggle against colonialism. We rallied together genuinely, irrespective of our differences in size, political or military power, and economic strength for a common cause. That is to gain independence and bring prosperity to our nations. Thinking about the present, I see that the modern day international relations are marred by self-interest of the states and their struggle for power. We feel that the very colonialism that we had fought and freed ourselves from a few decades ago is making a comeback in a different form in today's global scenario. New power blocks are emerging. States are intervening in the affairs of other states using their strength. And the past seems to be resurfacing. The threats emanating from these developments will be harmful to small nations like ours. Our independence and sovereignty are at risk and we should get together as we have done in the past to face these challenges. I emphasize the need for cooperation between Asia and Africa to prevent attempts by interested parties, to intervene in the internal affairs of developing nations. Honorable Speaker, for the past 50 years or so, we have been talking of South-South cooperation and of the need to work together for common prosperity. These deliberations, it seems, have reminded uh, most of the time and academic exercise. If our deliberations were transformed into real action, the situation would have been different. For instance, if you take a look at trade patterns, most of the trade of the developing nations is still done with the developed world. It is therefore imperative for us to get together and do more trade among the developing nations with a view to achieving prosperity for us all. Honorable Speaker, friends, Seychelles and Sri Lanka share many commonalities, such as their identity as developing nations, their colonial past and their views on international issues. However, most important of all of these 
is our common heritage in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is our legacy. Being island nations, both our countries face challenges such as sensitive environments exposed to natural disasters, limited markets, and high dependence on marine and coastal resources. However, we have a vast pool of resources in the Indian Ocean. It is the world's third largest ocean through which 40% of global trade goes through, creating major sea routes connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The nations that have inherited the rights of this ocean of resources must get together to embark upon a common approach to harness its potential for the benefit of our peoples. I see the Indian Ocean Commission, of which Seashells is a member, as one such as such organization that provides the island nations of the Indian Ocean a platform to discuss their issues and to forge a common approach to tap the resources of the vast Indian Ocean. Sri Lanka is keen to join the Indian Ocean Commission and we are grateful to the seashells for the support extended to our application for membership, membership of this commission, Mr. Speaker. Island nations can play a pivotal role in the international and regional politics as well. To quote my good friend, President uh, Alex Mitchell, I quote, the island have a, critical, have a critical role to play. The relations to the reform and development of the world's multilateral architecture. Islands are often at the epicent of global politics, unquote. Honorable Speaker, being an island nation, Sri Lanka is very much concerned about the protecting the maritime environment and the natural habitat habitat of the country. Islands to have their own endemic fauna and flora. And Sri Lanka is blessed with an abundance of such natural resources. We are also sensitive to the repercussions of global warming, which pose a threat to small island nations like yours and ours. For these reasons, Sri Lanka takes this phenomenon very seriously and is committed to policies to reduce the production of greenhouse gases, thus contributing to the mitigation effects of global warming and the re resultant rise of sea levels. Honorable Speaker, as I speak before this August gathering of lawmakers of seashells, let me provide you with a brief 
account of the present state of my country. After a long drawn conflict against separatist terrorism, which unlashed its brutal forces upon the citizens of my country for th nearly 30 years, we are now enjoying a durable peace and political stability, having eliminated the menace of terrorism from our midst. With a view to expediting the national reconciliation process, we have taken concrete steps to implement the recommendations of the lessons learned and Reconciliation Commission that was appointed by me, all Sri Lankans, the members are of Sri Lankan. Necessary budgetary allocations have been provided by the government for the implementation of the LLRC recommendations through a national action plan. Since the end of the conflict, we have embarked upon the massive infrastructure development projects that would, given, that would give the people of Sri Lanka the dividends of, the pe dividends of, the, of peace. Our aim is to develop Sri Lanka as a regional hub in five strategic areas, namely knowledge, commercial, naval, and maritime, aviation, and energy. My government's policy, having Mahindra Chintana, vision for the future, outlines our strategies to become the regional hub in these five areas. However, while we are trying to bring about national reconciliation and economic development, we are not without post-conflict challenges. Interested parties endeavor to undermine our victory over terrorism and humiliate us in the international scenes. 